Welcome everyone to live training, live day number 10 on our weekly YouTube live, how to pass the NCLEX, live day number 10. So if you've missed the previous days, please go back to our YouTube channel and watch from day one to day nine. Tonight, today we're going to be talking about a very, very interesting topic. We're going to be discussing a selector that apply. And I want to welcome each one of you. If you're a nursing student, you're preparing for the NCLEX. This YouTube channel is for you, NCLEX Crusade International. We've been helping nurses for over seven years already in our online academy to prepare for the NCLEX effectively. And our YouTube channel is uh, very famous for our three seven day training that many, many of you have already seen. But if you haven't seen them already, make sure you <coughs> make sure you go back and watch the three seven days training that we have on NCLEX preparation. Today's topic is going to be cardiac catheterization. As you can see in this question states, the nurse is talking with a client who is scheduled for a cardiac catheterization, which of the following findings would be essential to follow up. Select all that apply. As you know, on the next generation NCLEX, select all that applies, they are partial credit. So even if you miss one answer or two answers, you still can get some partial credit. So always remember to only select those answers that you are 100% sure that are correct answers. I'm going to talk about the answers of this question at the end of the video. Make sure, <coughs> make sure you see first the explanation of what a cardiac catheterization procedure is. So let's begin with that. A cardiac Catheterization is a common invasive procedure used to diagnose structural and functional diseases of the heart and great vessels. So in other words, this procedure is either used to diagnose any structural problems in the heart or also find out about diseases that could be affecting the heart and great vessels vessels. What are common sites used for a cardiac catheterization? <coughs> the femoral artery, the radial artery, the brachial artery, and the internal jugular vein. This procedure involves the percutaneous insertion of a radiopaque catheter into a large vein or an artery. How is this procedure done? We're going to be talking in details the difference between a right and left cardiac catheterization. But in either, uh, either of them, a fluoroscopy is used to guide and advance the catheter through the right and left heart, depending on which cardiac catheterization the doctor is doing, referred as a right or left heart catheterization. What are the indications for a cardiac cath? When is it required or necessary a cardiac catheterization? Well, these main five conditions. In angina, chest pain, in patients with atherosclerosis and diabetes mellitus, cardiomyopathy, congenital <coughs> heart disease, and coronary angioplasty and stent placement. So the, here are some indications, okay? It's main five, but also in cases of heart failure, heart valve disease, myocardial infarction, a previous coronary artery bypass surgery, and also to rule out as a diagnostic procedure any coronary blockage. 
Now, these are the indications, but what are some risks associated with a cardiac cath? Acute kidney injury with the use of contrast, a blood clot or damage to, damage to a blood vessel, cardiac arrhythmias, heart ischemia, or infarction, hemorrhage, infection, stroke, a sudden blockage of a coronary artery, and a tear in the artery lining. Why am I sharing with you these indications and risks factors associated with cardiac catheterization? Because commonly, questions that are selected or apply use this information to test nursing students and you need to be prepared. When we talk about a left cardiac catheterization, what is the difference? What is the difference between the left heart catheterization and a right cardiac catheterization? Well, left heart catheterization is performed to evaluate the aortic arch and major branches. Also, to check the patency of the coronary arteries and the function of the left ventricle and mitral and aortic valves. Remember, on previous days, we've talked about the different heart valves. The four heart valves in the heart is in, a, in another training. So if you haven't seen it, make sure you go back <coughs> and uh, watch those trainings as well. So how is the insertion done? What, what is the uh, procedure? How is it performed? So the insertion will be through usually the right femoral artery. So here we can see the right femoral artery then passing through the right common iliac artery, then progressing through the descending abdominal aorta, then progressing to the uh, thoracic aorta, then the aortic arch, and finally into the ascending aorta, where it's going to meet the coronary arteries, the opening of the coronary arteries, first the right and then the left coronary arteries. So as you can see, this left cardiac catheterization approach is going to be through the femoral artery to visualize certain structures of the heart, including the aortic arch, and also frequently to assess the patency of the coronary arteries. Okay? What is a right cardiac <coughs> catheterization? A right heart catheterization usually precedes a left heart catheterization. So sometimes they are done one after the other. It is performed to assess the function of the right ventricle and also the function of the tricuspid and pulmonary valve. This procedure involves the passage of a catheter through the brachial internal jugular passing through the superior vena cava into the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and pulmonary arterioles. Okay, so let's remember a little bit of the anatomy of the superior vena cava, because in this approach, the uh, catheter passes through the superior vena cava. But how is it done? How, how, why is this possible? Remember that the superior vena cava is formed by the combination of the right and the left brachiocephalic vein. So we can see in this uh, diagram, we see the superior vena cava, and then we see the, the junction of the right and left brachiocephalic vein. So here we see the left brachiocephalic vein and the right 
brachiocephalic vein. When they join, when they merge, them two form the superior vena cava. So how is the cardiac catheterization, a right cardiac catheterization done through the brachial vein approach, okay? If the brachial vein is used, basically the catheter progresses into the right axillary vein, then the right subclavian vein, the right brachiocephalic vein, and then finally the superior vena cava, which enters the right atrium. So it's very, very interesting of this approach. We can see here the right subclavian vein, okay? So remember, the beginning was the right axillary vein, then the right subclavian vein, then the right brachiocephalic, so it continues to the right brachiocephalic, and then finally the superior vena cava, which is going to go into the right atrium, okay? So now you know how this approach is done. Now, how is a cardiac catheterization done, a right cardiac catheterization done through the right femoral vein approach? How does that go? What is the process? Okay, so the catheter enters the right femoral vein, which then progresses into the right common iliac vein. So we can see it here, the right common iliac vein, then is going to finish in the inferior vena cava. Okay? So remember that the vena cava is formed by the combination of the right common and left common iliac vein. We can see it here, right and left common iliac vein, that at the junction, it forms the inferior vena cava. Pretty similar to what we saw in the previous picture, but in relationship to the superior vena cava. After the junction, we saw the formation of the superior vena cava. Now, what are cardiac catheterization nursing interventions? This is the how is is called the meat and potatoes, the most important thing that you need to know for your NCLEX. What are nursing interventions pre-procedure in a cardiac catheterization? Now you know what a cardiac catheterization is. Now you know the different approaches, but you need to know this part. Pre-procedure, most important thing before the procedure is even uh, done is an informed consent. Remember, what is your function in an informed consent? Your only function in informed consent is collecting the actual consent and being a witness that the patient understands the procedure, that the patient's questions were um, answered, that the patient knows the risk, the, what, what happens, what are the alternatives, and remember that all that information is provided by the doctor. Your only purpose is to identify that the patient received it, that the patient is alert, awake, alert, oriented, and able <coughs> to make medical decisions. Okay? So after the informed consent is collected, the next step is very, very important. Asking questions about allergic reaction to seafood, iodine, radiopaque dyes. Why? Why do I need to ask for allergies, Spe specifically this type of allergies? So tell me in the comment section, why? Why do I need to, to ask about allergies? Do you know why? Because during the procedure, Contrast media is used, right, to see the advancement of the catheter. But if the patient is allergic to that contrast, we need to know. We need to know. Now, what happens if the patient is allergic? 
and we're just not going to do the procedure? Well, if the patient is allergic, the patient can be pre-medicated with antihistamines, corticosteroids to prevent a reaction. <clears throat> so if a cardiac catheterization, it is finally required, even if a patient is allergic, then we just have to pre-medicate the patient to prevent an allergic reaction. Number three, we have to hold, we have to withhold solid foods for at least six to eight hours and liquids for four hours as prescribed by the doctor. And the main idea behind this is to prevent vomiting and aspiration during the procedure. Number four, we need to document the client's height and weight. We use this as a baseline. Also very important, renal function to determine the amount of dye to be administered. Now, another, impor another important question, why do we need to check for renal function? What's the reason behind that? Yes, we need it for a baseline, but why? Why do we have to check renal function? The reason is because the contrast is nephrotoxic. And then if the patient already has renal comprom compromise, the kidneys are compromised, the contrast can be very, very harmful to the patient. So we need to have that baseline of renal function. Okay. And of course, depending on the uh, lab values with the renal function, we're going to know exactly the amount of dye that will be administered during the procedure. Okay. We need baseline vital signs. We need to know the quality and presence of peripheral pulses to compare post procedure. So we need to know how are those pulses? Because for example, if they're using the right femoral artery approach, then we have to know how those distal pulses are to then compare post procedure to find out if circulation wise, if everything is okay. If we don't have a baseline, we cannot say, we cannot tell if there is a difference. Number six, extremely important. We have to prepare the patient for the insertion of the catheter by shaving or clipping the hair and cleaning the area with an antiseptic solution. Administer pre-procedure medications such as sedative if the patient requires it. Now, here is an NCLEX tip. You need to know this because this appears on the NCLEX very frequent when it comes to cardiac catheterization nursing interventions. NCLEX tip, metformin. What about metformin? If a patient is taking metformin and is scheduled to undergo a cardiac catheterization, this procedure requires the metformin to be withheld for at least 24 hours prior to the procedure. Why? Why? Because there is a risk of lactic acidosis and, of course, nephrotoxicity. So 24 hours before the procedure, we have to withhold metformin. Now, the next question is, when can we re <coughs> resume the administration of metformin post-procedure? The medication is not resumed until it's prescribed by the doctor, but usually it's going to take about 48 hours, 48 hours after the procedure and after renal function studies have been conducted and the renal function is normal. So you need to remember these two time frames. Metformin is withheld 24 hours prior and it's usually resumed 48 hours post procedure. Does that make sense? Do you understand this? Now, let's talk about 
other nursing interventions, but now in relationship to post procedure. So if you're liking our live training, make sure that you are liking our live transmission right now. If you're here and you're, there's about 105 nurses connected on YouTube. If you're here and you think that this is uh, interesting, that is helping you, make sure you hit that like button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and share it. If you are on a, in a group on WhatsApp or Telegram or whatever, copy the link, share it with other nurses so they can see it. If you're watching it on Facebook, share it. Share it on Facebook as well, like the video, and do not forget to go to our YouTube channel and subscribe, hit the bell so you don't miss any of the information. So let's continue with post-procedure. We need to monitor vital signs and cardiac rhythm for dysrhythmias. Remember, one of the complications of this procedure is cardiac dysrhythmias. <coughs> so we have to assess the vital signs and cardiac rhythm every 30 minutes for two hours initially, okay? In each minimum, okay? Assess for chest pain, dysrhythmia, and if chest pain occurs, we have to notify the healthcare provider immediately. No chest pain with this patient. That could be a sign of complication. Remember pre-procedure that we got baseline uh, distal pulses, Wow, well, now we're going to monitor peripheral pulses again. What are we looking for? Color, the warmth, sensation of the extremity distal to the insertion side. And we have to do this at least every 30 minutes for two hours initially. Some agencies prefer to do it a little bit more often, at least at the beginning in the first hour. They do it every 15 minutes. But uh, this is the information from the Sounders book, okay? Notify the healthcare provider if the patient is reporting any numbness, tingling, or if the extremity becomes cool, pale, and cyanotic. Why? Number four is an indication of cardiovascular compromise to that extremity. Also, if there are any any loss of peripheral pulse, we need to notify the doctor. That extremity is in danger. Remember, this indicates that oxygen is not flowing to uh, this part of the, of the body, all right? So this is extremely important. Let me, let me move the writing a little bit to the left so you can see it, so you can see everything. One second, here it is. You should be able to see it a little bit better, better there. All right. Okay, perfect. So let's continue. So now we know this important post-procedure nursing interventions. Also, the application of a sandbag or compression device is important to prevent bleeding. So the application of a sandbag or a compression device is required to prevent bleeding. So we need to monitor for bleeding because that is one of the complications, hemorrhage. If bleeding occurs, we need to apply manual pressure immediately and call the doctor. Remember that sometimes the bleeding can be internal. So we have to monitor for large hematoma formation. If there is hematoma developing, we also need to call the doctor. Keep the extremity extended, no flexion of the extremity for four to six hours if the femoral artery approach was used. So keeping the leg straight to prevent arterial occlusion. So number 11, maintaining <coughs> strict bed rest for six to 12 hours as prescribed, but an exception, the patient may be able to turn from side to side without elevating the head more than 15 degrees. So we can slightly elevate the head, no more than 15 degrees, but, but supine is the preferred position, okay? 
if the anticubital uh, blood vessel was used, we have to immobilize the arm with an arm board. And then if a, a bleeding device was used to stop the bleed, we have to assess that. Sometimes a, a specific device is used that uh, applies air to, to this band. It's like an, like, a, like an arm band. And we have to release the air little bit by little bit to let go of the compression to that artery. But uh, that is a, another procedure that we are not going to be discussing today. If we use this uh, vascular closure device to seal the artery pointer site, basically there is no need to use prolonged compression or bed rest. And the client may be out of bed a little bit earlier within one to two hours. Okay. Now, what are procedures that are associated with a cardiac catheterization? What else? What other procedures are associated with this intervention? We have two main procedures that are used to uh, cause revascularization of that affected artery. We have the cabbage and we have the PTCA or PCI percutaneous intervention or PTCA, percutaneous transluminum coronary angioplasty or the bypass surgery. Okay, so in this image, we can see two procedures associated with a cardiac catheterization. Okay, these two procedures are necessary to provide coronary revascularization. On the left hand side, we see the PTCA, okay? The PTCA is a type of percutaneous coronary intervention in which basically a balloon is used, is inflated within a coronary artery to break an, an atheroma and open the vessel's lumen. Why? Why is this done? To improve coronary artery blood flow. Sometimes, a stent is used instead of the uh, balloon. When they use a metal uh, mesh, this is a stent that provides a structural support to a coronary vessel. Basically, what it does is it prevents this vessel from closing. Okay, the cabbage, which is the bypass surgery, is a surgical procedure in which a blood vessel from another part of the body is grafted onto the occluded coronary artery, okay? So this is done, it's a creating like a bridge from one artery to another part of the uh, coronary artery just below the blockage. In this image that we're looking at here, we can see two blockage in the coronary arteries, okay? One of the blockage, we can see is in the posterior, posterior <coughs> descending coronary artery. Okay, remember that the posterior descending coronary artery is a branch of the right coronary artery. So what did they do here? Surgically, a graft has been done with a small portion, usually the saphenous vein. Okay. Usually the saphenous vein is used to do this bridge. In the photo, you can also see the anastomosis between the obstructed coronary artery and the ascending aorta. So we can see it here. You see here part of the ascending aorta. We see the anastomosis, the bypass, using a part of the saphenous vein just below the blockage. You see the blockage is here. So they provide uh, oxygenated blood from part of the ascending aorta doing a bridge to the part of the coronary artery that is below the blockage. Okay. On the left side, we see an obstruction of the anterior descending coronary artery, which basically is a branch from the left coronary artery. The anastomosis, anastomosis means union, is done between the left subclavian artery and 
the blocked artery. We can see it here. So the bridge is from the left subclavian to just below of the coronary artery to bypass the blockage, okay? It is important to know that 75% of myocardial infarctions involve blockage of the left anterior descending coronary artery. So in summary, what are procedures associated with cardiac catheterization, PTCA, which means percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, stent placement, cabbage, which is <coughs> coronary artery bypass graft, radiation placement, and also fractional flow reserve. Basically, basically if you don't know what a fractional flow reserve is, is a procedure to see the degree of coronary obstruction to any of the, uh, uh, either the coronary artery or any other artery. And then finally, we have the question. Now, it's going to be much, much easier for you to answer this question. So, which of the following findings will be essential to follow up after a patient is undergone a cardiac catheterization? Is that the question? Is the question about after or before? That is important. You need to learn to read the question and identify if it's a positive or negative scenario, if it is pre-procedure or post-procedure, be careful. The question says, the nurse is talking <coughs> with a client who is scheduled for a cardiac catheterization. Which of the following findings is essential to follow up? So the question is about pre-procedure. Pre-procedure. So what do we need to follow up? What are your answers? Comment in the comment section your answers. I want to see how you're thinking. All right, uh, congratulations. I see somebody here, TK. I don't know the name, uh, commenting that uh, you found this YouTube channel, applied all the knowledge, and it has been great. You passed your NCLEX uh, two or three weeks ago, and I believe it significantly changed my outcome. I'm here to say thank you. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. <coughs> thank you for coming back and uh, telling us uh, your results. So congratulations. All right, perfect. Let's see. So what do we need to follow up? Answer number one, elevated serum C-reactive protein level. Do you think it's important to follow up with this pre-procedure? What is the C-reactive protein? What is that going to tell us? Well, it can tell us about acute inflammation, may indicate an elevated risk for coronary artery disease. However, this is not an important indicator for an acute cardiac event. So I don't need to follow up on this. So number one, we can eliminate. Number two, previous allergic reaction to IV contrast. Oh, this is important. Remember, it was my number two, number two follow-up question pre-procedure. Right? The first one was consent. That's done. Now, what else do you need to do? Allergic reaction. Because if there are allergic reactions, then we have to pre-medicate the patient. 
So number two makes a whole lot of sense. Number three, prolonged PR interval on the electrocardiogram. Okay, so he's talking about a heart block here, right? Let's see if you know which heart block we see prolongation of the PR interval that it is constant. I'll give you a little bit extra detail so you can differentiate. As you know, there is first degree heart block, second degree type one heart block, second degree type two heart block, and third degree or complete heart block. Where do we see prolongation of the PR interval that it is constant? In what heart block we see that? First degree heart block, atrial <coughs> ventricular block. So is this important to follow up on this? Not really. Many patients have this and they are usually completely asymptomatic. So I don't need to follow up on this at the moment. It doesn't really relate to the procedure. Number four, the patient received metformin today for type two diabetes mellitus. Do we need to follow up on that? Do we need to follow up on that? Yes, we need to follow up on that. Why? Remember the risk of lactic acidosis. So if we administer an iodine contrast and also the patient received metformin, <clears throat> this contrast can cause an accumulation of the metformin <clears throat> in the bloodstream. And the result could be lactic acidosis. So remember, we need to discontinue the metformin 24 hours prior to the procedure and then can resume up to 48 hours after the procedure. So we need to follow up on that. And number five, elevated <clears throat> serum creatinine level. Hmm, what do you think about this one? Elevated serum creatinine level. So creatine is going to tell us about the kidneys. Remember, usual range 0 0.6 to 1.2. So if we see an elevation in the creatinine, talks to us about a kidney compromise. Remember that this uh, contrast media can cause acute kidney injury, okay? In patients that prior to administration of the contrast have already an elevated creatinine level. So remember, Patients with renal impairment should not receive iodinated or contrast media unless it's absolutely necessary. So number five, it is a good answer. So the final answer is two, four, and five. Okay? In the description of this video, I posted a link to both of our memberships. We have two memberships one for our English speaking nurses and one for our Latino Spanish speaking nurses. <clears throat> if you're looking to join an online membership that you can learn about prioritization, critical thinking, content, join our international membership. I have posted the link in the description section. My advisor is also posting the link here in the chat. And if you are Spanish speaking and you need a membership that helps you prepare for the NCLEX in Spanish, a little bit of bilingual, then you can join our gold membership, which has more than 170 videos to teach you strategies, critical thinking, practice questions, several courses inside the same membership that will help you drastically. <coughs> Here is the number to our academy. If you're English speaking, call the 813-212-6965. If you speak Spanish, you want to talk to our Spanish advisor, 352-565-4256. That is it for tonight's training. Make sure 
subscribe to our channel, hit the bell so you don't miss uh, tomorrow's training, and also remember, like and share this video with other people out there.